Please join me in giving Dr. Ashdown a warm welcome as she presents to us this important contribution to the study and teaching of fashion design. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> great. Thank you very much uh, for that great introduction and thank you all for coming and for logging in today. Um, it's great to see so many familiar faces and some that are new to me. So revising this book, um, ended up being more of a challenge than I bargained for because I did most of it during the COVID lockdown. I love working with people and I feel strongly that no worthwhile endeavor is ever done in isolation. Although I had many fantastic collaborate, collaborators, both nationally and internationally, it was only through email. So I'm doubly glad to be here today in person <laughs> to share with you my goals for the book and how I edited the book to get to achieve those goals. I'm also going to tell a lot of other stuff too, some of which none of you have heard before, no matter how long you think you know me. <laughs> so, <laughs> Helen Joseph Armstrong is a professor, designer, and author based in Los Angeles. I actually only met her once very briefly, many years ago. Uh, I was in California for some meeting or conference, I can't remember now. But I, I, I know Helen's work very well, as we all do. It's amazing, it's been used and appreciated worldwide. Her drafting book, the one that's shown here, the pattern making for fashion design, flat pattern, it's used and appreciated worldwide. Um, she uh, really believed in getting the book in the hands of students. So I have a feeling that all the translations that are out there, and there are many of them, uh, were done with no remuneration for her. So that's a philosophy I share. The flat pattern making book was her first major book, published in 1985. It's in the fifth edition now. And it was so much more comprehensive than other books out there. Um, and it had really impressive illustrations, more than 1,400 of them. The technical illustrations, they were drawn by her son, Vincent Marusi, and they're exceedingly clear, precise, and informative. And the step-by-step -step instructions that go with them are very thorough and complete. So the, the draping book, that was published in 2000. So, at the time that was published, I'd been teaching a draping class for about 10 years, and I was really dissatisfied with the available books. Helen's books gave so many things that are so important that other books lacked. Um, as with the flat pattern book, she had a, a large number of styles. It covered a lot of, lot of ground. But she also introduced strategies to teach novices how to handle fabrics. We, we ignore that, and it, it's not insignificant. She included advice on how to read a 2D sketch and plan for how you're going to create that pattern. And she described variety in body proportion and posture, which no other book did or does. She included instructions for making a custom dress form by padding a standard form. Um, she incorporated drafting techniques into draping where it was important. And most importantly, she described how to balance and refine the fit of the pattern, the draped pattern. Most books just say, okay, do this, drape this, do this, 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 done. And you're not done. You're not done until you balance and fit the pattern. So I adopted it immediately. I used it in my classes for 18 years through all three editions. Um, and then, then the publishers contacted me and asked me if I would be willing to put in a proposal <laughs> to edit this book for the fourth edition. And I said, no, <laughs> I could not imagine editing a book that I had so much respect for and that had a major effect on my own teaching. But I knew the book wasn't working. It wasn't working at all as it should. As important as the concepts were that Helen introduced, they were not implemented evenly throughout the book, nor were they effectively presented for today's students. And I felt that this book, along with all the other pattern making books on the market, had a major flaw. So I'm going to back up now because I think it's important to tell you why I feel so strongly about this. Um, and then I'm going to go back up even further and tell you the path that I was on to get to where I am today. So each of these concepts I'm going to say right now are much more discussion than we have time for, but maybe we can talk about them later. I believe that our apparel industry is badly broken. 
We face sustainability issues from fast fashion, from offshoring to countries with few or no environmental or social controls, and from relying on outdated manufacturing and marketing methods. All these factors result in closets overfilled with clothing, most of what ends up in a landfill. Ah, so even, I, I, you, know, you can tell, I'm, I feel really strong about this. Um, the, the, pro the big problem is that it not only ends up in a landfill, it ends up in a landfill after being worn very few times. And even when we virtuously donate our clothing instead of throwing it away, much of it is sent overseas. And guess what? 40% of it ends up in landfills overseas. So it's a huge problem. So um, <coughs> I have some more things to say about <laughs> The, the system we have. I believe the system of ready-to-wear sizing cannot, cannot provide well-fitting clothing for the population and at its inception it was not intended to be worn off the rack without alterations. I believe that draping can be a more efficient and effective way to provide well-fitting clothing than the flat pattern method used by the industry. Ah, uh, what else do I believe? <laughs> I believe that students need to understand body variation. They need to understand the fit of clothing, not with just how-to lessons on how to correct fit or how-to lessons on how to make a style, but with a deep understanding of the pattern-making concepts between, behind well-balanced and well-fitted garments. I believe we need to train the next generation for a future industry where all clothing that is produced is loved, valued, and worn long enough to justify its embodied resource use. This can only happen if we provide good fit and good design for everyone. So I've reached these conclusions based on 40 years of teaching pattern making and 30 years of research on body variation, sizing, and fit. But I think that it is important to go back and see wh how I ended up where I ended up. So first, my training is not in fashion design. I have never taken a fashion design course in my life. <laughs> uh, let's see. Oops, sorry. As a kid, I was profoundly uninterested in clothing, but I always loved making things, all kinds of things. So that's me between my older sister and my younger brother in the middle. I started sewing very young, and by the time this picture was taken, I'd been sewing for four or five years already. In high school, Mrs. Allen was a great home economics teacher, but we didn't get along. <laughs> uh, I'd been sewing for so long using patterns that I made myself, and I didn't like working from a commercial pattern, and I hated the fact that the blouse and the skirt that I spent so much time on did not fit me. <laughs> In the 60s, I was an anti-fashion hippie wearing paisley blouses and patched jeans, and I had long, stringy hair. <coughs> and I still loved making things. In the second photo, I'm uh, folding origami. I always had something in my hands. Um, the last picture is from when I was 20 years old. Yeah, I know I look young, but I was 20 years old, <laughs> a junior in college, when I joined my sister in Germany, and we bicycled across Europe and England together. That's another story. <laughs> I'd gone to college planning to be a, a Spanish, Spanish major, but someone found out I could sew, and I was drafted into the costume shop, and that changed everything. So I spent the next 18 years enthusiastically making costumes for the theater, and I loved it. In the theater, you work with an endless number of clothing silhouettes on a wide range of body shapes and sizes with every fabric and every uh, material imaginable, imaginable. These photos are all from the Milwaukee Repertory Theater where I was costume shop manager before I came to Cornell in the same position for Theater Cornell. And I was really pleased to find these pre-digital photos um, online and I thank the archives department at the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee Library for putting them online. Working in the theater I costumed every body size from little children the actor whose waist was longer than, larger than the 60 inch tape measure that wrapped around him. That's a meter and a half, okay? <coughs> uh, I not only made clothes, but I also modified bodies. So we have Tom Blair here in a, uh, uh, a uh, on the upper left in a play called A Little Bit Less of Normal. His, 
my guy. <laughs> his uh, leg was strapped up behind him, uh, and then his foot was twisted around and strapped under his buttocks, and I designed the strapping, and then designed the pants that fit and fell uh, normally around them. I also built the padding for uh, the, the image on the upper right. Uh, that's Dead Souls, the play. And uh, I made the fat padding for Henry Strozier, the actor, in the cap there. This image also shows um, why, how clothing fit can help to find characters in the theater. The Dead Souls costumes were designed to fit too tightly on the greedy, corrupt surf owners. And the, uh, but on the other hand, the surf costume and Marley's costume in the middle there from, um, from uh, Christmas Carol, they were made very loose to help portray emaciated bodies. Actually, the same actor, Larry Hsu, is the landowner in the seated in Dead Souls, and he played Marley in Christmas Carol, so that was kind of fun. Uh, on the other hand, uh, let's see, okay, the Mother Courage on the lower right photo, although she's a peasant, she's also a war profiteer and a successful businesswoman. So she and her children are portrayed in well-fitting, aesthetically pleasing versions of peasant clothing. And the fool in King Lear on the lower left photo was my favorite body modification photo <laughs> uh, project. He is kneeling in a false-bottomed cart and you could just strap legs around him, right? So that he looks like he has legs on him, but I didn't. What I did was I built a, um, a uh, fiberglass form that fit over his thigh and gradually built up the leg off of that so he could move his legs. It was very imp um, uh, effective. That, by, by the way, the, the Cordelia in this production was Glenn Close at the beginning of her career, so probably the most famous actor I costume. Although Jimmy Smith's here at Cornell was a pretty close second. <laughs> he had an amazing uh, uh, Aztec-influenced costume in the wedding scene in Taming of the Shrew. I hope there's a picture of that somewhere. I couldn't find one, but ah, that was amazing. So in the theater, of course, I also made all kinds of body shapes and, and, and uh, corsets for the women. Um, every imaginable period that changed the bodies of the actress, but I also learned the importance of movement and clothing because those actresses, no matter how accurate the corset, didn't look right, didn't look period, unless they held their bodies in the correct posture. It just, it just wiped out anything that I'd done squeezing their body in. <laughs> I might as well not have done it. So we had walking lessons, sitting lessons, standing lessons for the actresses. Also, fat, fat padding, pregnant pads, they didn't didn't look right unless the actor appeared to be carrying weight. So, so still not interested in fashion, still not a fan of home sewing or home sewing patterns. All the work we did in making costumes was from scratch. But still fascinated with bodies, making them, changing them, understanding how they move um, and clothing them. Um, and I was a problem solver and a technical designer at heart. So now it's 80, 1986. I'm 35 years old, and I realize that working in theater is not the place to build a retirement account. <laughs> so I looked for something else, uh, and I discovered right here at Cornell an amazing mentor, Susan Watkins, who invented the field of functional apparel design here at Cornell. I completed a master's degree with her using the Cornell Employee Degree Program, and again, the focus was bodies, body fit, uh, body movement fit and understanding a whole new range of fabrics with amazing properties, but now added thermal control of the body, um, uh, uh, protection, all kinds of new, exciting, wonderful um, things to, to, to problem solve on. But I found my true research focus at the University of Minnesota as a PhD student, where I found studies on body variation and clothing sizing and fit for the population were m fascinating. So. I came back to Cornell after I got my degree to do the research I was interested in and found myself teaching fashion design students. <laughs> and I found that I love teaching them. That I love their creativity. I love their willingness to try anything. I love their excitement about their work. But I still was not really interested in fashion. <laughs> I hope I didn't make that, I hope I hid that from them. <laughs> you guys will have to tell me how successful I was at doing that. From the beginning, I wanted students to work with a variety of body types. The photo here is from the Human Ecology Archives, and it was taken in my office in 1995. 
And you can see the larger dress form behind me there that I had purchased um, for, for the students. But the barriers were overwhelming. Students really resisted making clothing on different body types. Um, it was difficult to get different sizes in the studio. It just cost too much. And the storage, oh, the storage issues were enormous. Uh, but most importantly, this, the industry the students were training for required them to design for their standard or ideal body. So my desire to expand students' appreciation for an ability to design for different bodies went on the shelf. With all the body awareness movements in recent years, the super tall and thin aesthetic still holds firm. The ideal body is a fashion model with proportions that represent only 2% of the population. There was a New York Times article last, last month. Did, did any of you see that? You saw it, yeah. Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth Patton was the author. Uh, fashion industry still wor worships skinniness. An interview with mill model Jill Courtleaf, who's a rare size for a model. Her hips measure 105 centimeters, that's 41 inches. That's actually just a little bit on the low side of average. But she is put it on the stage as a plus size model. So things haven't changed. They haven't changed in the industry, nor in the studios since 1995. So that kind of sets the stage for what I did with this. <laughs> so the class, it's a really classic text, and it's rooted in 1950s teaching methods of home economics lessons. And it needed so many changes, teaching methods to, uh, you know, to, to, fit, to fit with modern students. New technologies needed to be introduced. It needed better organization. It needed greater consistency. Um, it needed to be more accessible to a global audience. Uh, the, a, a, a chart in the back with metric numbers compared to <laughs> imperial ones doesn't quite uh, help at all. Um, but I still needed to remain faithful to Helen Joseph Armstrong's wonderful, wonderful work. And not insignificant, it needed to be a hell of a lot lighter and have a lay flat binding so it'd be useful in the studio. Uh, version 3 was not useful. When you laid it flat, you broke the binding, the pages started falling out. It, was, it, it weighed actually a pound and a half more than this guy does. This one's heavy enough. So it stayed in, lo it stayed in lockers. I'd been informed that collaborating with Helen was not possible, but the more I thought about it, the more I wanted to try and change the book into a text for this century. So I finally contacted the editors and proposed a total reorganization and rewriting with a totally free hand, and they agreed. And they were amazing. My editors were just incredible. I can't say enough about them. So my first focus was the images. The fashion Im illustrations in the third edition are great representatives of the established style. But they are all, all sketches of young, Caucasian, tall, slender models that verge on the anorexic. This popular style of fashion figure is a unique aesthetic that has steadily developed since ready-to-wear clothing was first introduced in the 1900s. It has nothing to do with per perfect body or the great body to design for. Any body is a great body to design for. We've just been blindsided into thinking that this is the only way to design. So. The proportion of the dress forms and the technical drawings match the standard dress forms used in apparel studios. So the, the, the illustrations and the dress forms are somewhat more real, realistic than the fashion drawings, but they still represent the smaller hourglass-shaped percentage of the population. Industry uses these proportions for their fit models almost exclusively, and they attempt to deliver good fit with proportionally grade, graded patterns. These graded patterns do not provide either good fit or good acceptable aesthetics for the population. So unrealistic fashion figures and small dress forms are embedded in our industry. Therefore, wholesale change in the third edition, from the third edition images was neither feasible nor desirable. The technical drawings and the fashion sketches that are proportional to them had to stay. I believe that change must and can occur but gradually and dependent on the development of new technologies to replace ready-to-wear and mass production. Therefore, I made the decision to retain most of the third edition images, but I was determined to introduce a new aesthetic along with them to represent the whole population and to remind designers that they're not designing for fashion models. 
They're designing for people with a whole range of bodies. Oops. The chapter headings were what gave me, gave me an opportunity to do this. This is what the third edition headings look like. 40, 40 pages, <laughs> 40 pages in that book that was already too big that didn't contribute anything as far as I was concerned. So we eliminated all those images. And I collected photographs from everywhere. I corrected, collected them from online, from friends, from students and my colleagues. I wanted photos of people who were comfortable in their bodies and comfortable in their clothing. I looked for images of people of all ages, all ethnicities, all sizes, all proportions, and all conditions of being. And then amazing artist, Yolana Sefranova created layouts of these wonderful personalities for the book. We created 17 layouts with 70, 76 people in all. 40% of them are Caucasian, 60% are Asian, Hispanic, or black. Half are young and half are older, ranging from mid-30s to over 55. Half are relatively slender and half have curves or significant body weight ranging up to plus size. There are five males and one person who's non-binary. We included this young woman in a wheelchair, a person with a prosthetic leg, a pregnant woman, and a little person with proportions unique to this population. So that's my universe. I was still unhappy with the fashion sketches that had to be retained, but realized there was a simple way to reduce their impact. Just cropping the faces away put the, puts the focus back on the clothing where it belongs. And here you can see a direct comparison of the fashion figure next to the slender, but more realistic proportions of the woman, of the, uh, uh, person from my, my universe. <laughs> so, ah, sorry I have so many words, guys. I just have so much I want to tell you. <laughs> so the rewrites were challenging but very absorbing. And what I need to do now is explain to you what I mean regarding the engineering approach. If you think about it, clothing is actually one of the most complex of all designed objects. Apparel designers design for a wide variation among bodies using materials with countless different properties. They accommodate many different environmental, social, and aesthetic needs. Clothing interacts with moving bodies. It impacts temperature regulation and it interfaces directly with sensitive and sensing skin. So, clothing, however, carries the stigma of being women's work and it's been dismissed as frivolous for decades. The traditional male-based engineering fields, designing and building machines and engines and structures are seen as more substantial, important, and complex, although they, although they encompass so many fewer materials and conditions. They can be reduced to a set of equations. Clothing cannot, it's too complex. So, we have, we have a wonderful way of working with clothing. It's, it's, heuristic, it's interactive and heuristic, but it's disregarded. It's not important. It's not, I don't know, scientific enough. <laughs> but it is, it, it is what works. Pattern making books perpetuate the point of view of clothing design and construction as a simple process. They're written as a how-to book, as if learning how to make a garment is our set number of styles is all that's needed. I loved how-to books when I was a kid. Oh, 101 ways to make things to make with a popsicle stick. It just, it just, that's what got me going as a kid. I adored them. They're great for kids, but they're not the way to teach apparel students. <laughs> Professional designers need to understand the interactions of body, materials, and silhouettes, not just how to make clothing. So in this edition, I changed the emphasis to focus on discussions of overall processes and deeper dives into the why of many of the procedures we take for granted. Why are darts shortened from the bust point in the truing process? Why do so many pattern shapes incorporate side seams? And why are they placed as they are? Why are some darts set by folding and others by measuring? What's the relationship between the stride of a crotch, the angle of an inseam, and the fit over the buttocks in a pair of pants? Many of these topics were hinted at. I learned a lot about them as a young teacher from Helen's book, but they weren't fully discussed. They were just, you know, they were there, but they weren't, um, they were, they weren't, they weren't uh, explained in a way that made them clear at all. 
So the text needed to be reorganized, refocused, rewritten, and added to. The language that described the standard body as perfect and ideal needed to be changed. Um, the, the, the te in order to make the text appropriate worldwide, references to US sizes needed to be eliminated and metric measures needed to be added next to every single imperial measurement in the book, in the text and in the illustrations. And that was a huge task, let me tell you. <laughs> I missed a few, you'll find some. Tell me about them. <laughs> I had inf information about working with new technologies, photos in place of drawings where I could, and I also made videos for the students. This was very important to me, as I wanted to deflect students from the draping vi videos on YouTube, which are universally bad, very, very bad. I needed to develop instructor ma materials to help explain the concepts in each chapter, and I wanted to keep the full range of designs while reducing the size of the book, and none of this would have been possible without the ability to put material online. So there are an equal, oops, sorry, uh, there are an equal number of, I need to do this, or, sorry, I have too many words on these slides. There are an equal number of uh, pages online as there are in the book. Okay, so there's about 500 and some pages here. There's about 500 and some pages there. So, plus the videos, plus uh, vocabulary cards and quizzes for the students. Boy, I hated writing those quizzes. If you think you hate taking them, I hated writing them <laughs> even more. <laughs> and then a lot of information for instructors, um, uh, learning objectives and instructions for every single chapter and a PowerPoint for every single cha chapter, which is editable, so you can, the instructors can use it however they want. So, <laughs> that was what my task was with this book. It was, it was amazing. I, I loved it. Um, it was frustrating. Uh, I didn't do a, a totally good job with it, but hey, there's a fifth edition. <laughs> so, I, 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 I think I made a lot of really good changes. So, so, um, so let's take a really brief tour of the book and see some of the changes. The first six chapters now, the organization wasn't good, but now the first six chapters contain foundational skills and concept, really the first five chapters. In the first chapter on tools, I talk about buying quality professional tools instead of relying on the local fabric store, getting, getting uh, uh, substandard tools, which you never should have as a professional. You want the best tools in the world. Chapters two and three discuss important foundation topics. Chapter two, understanding textile properties. And chapter three, the dress form. I couldn't include a lot on fabric properties just because there wasn't room, but for these visual students, what I could do was give them pictures. So I took pictures of 60, that six zero, 60 fabrics. <laughs> I think that's a little bit due to the craziness of the pandemic. <laughs> um, and each one, I had a couple of pictures of the draped fabric, a couple of pictures of a close-up, one with a light behind it so you can kind of see the size of the yarn, um, and then a, a microscopic version that shows you the weave and the, and the yarn structure. Um, and I also had the fiber name, the fiber content, yards, yarn size and structure, and weave or knit structure for each one. So with 60 of them, you can really uh, scan through these. And, and I think understand a lot about fabrics that is really important for beginning students. The dress form, understanding the relationship with the, between the dress form and the model is such an important concept and ha encompasses so much more than bust waist hip measurement. Um, and I, this is conveyed in this first chapter image with a standard dress form and then two custom forms. The one on the left has the same basic circumferences but a different height to circumference ratio. And on the right, we see a form with curves and a hip angle that match her body. So these are a few of the things that are in this book. It's uh, in this chapter, I'm sorry, it's a really important chapter. So the dress form and the body and the body, both posture and proportions are illustrated and discussed. Um, and extensive body measurement comparisons are made. Preparing the form is an important element in Helen Joseph Armstrong's draping method, creating tactile landmarks so that you can easily and quickly um, find the, the uh, points you need and set the balance of the garment. So this next image is in the online materials and it's an example of the online approach to, I'm sorry, the engineering approach to measurement of the body. Landmark location is important for mapping the body to the clothing and for reliable repeat measurements. And traditionally, 
my landmarks are described very generally. For example, measure from the shoulder point to the neck, and to the neckline for the shoulder seam length. Teaching students the structure of the body, the skeletal system, and the important skeletal points that can be palpated that relate to body movement gives them information that relates directly to, co to clothing fit. Sorry, I've lost my cursor there. Um, so uh, then we also have instructions on how to pad the form to match, this is also online, to match not only dimensions but the body shapes and proportions. And even if a student never does this time consuming, tedious process, just seeing it, I think, is a way to understand the difference between actual bodies and dress forms. And I'm going to save the discussion for Haskell to later because I have a lot to say about that. I have a lot to say about everything. <laughs> so I consolidated all the basic skills, that learning how to handle part of it, and techniques in chapter four so that particularly for beginner and for students who have more experience but maybe have been started on the wrong path, they have um, a, a place to go for really learning these techniques uh, it's separate from the draping process. They're not instinctive. They must be learned. And I, I illustrated this new chapter entirely with photographs. The fifth chapter, the basic silhouette, teaches the draping process. It's the first drape, and it's the most important one because it encompasses maybe 85% of what you'll do with the draping process. So the draping process for the one dart bodice, a combined drafting and draping process for the basic skirt, and a draft for the basic set in sleeve. It also describes fitting and balancing the patterns and truing patterns, and these are all foundational concepts. So a really important chapter, and again, I incorporated photographs where I could. The plan to hire a photographer was a victim of the pandemic. <laughs> so I purchased a camera, a tripod, and lights so I could photograph myself. I'm not a photographer, but they turned out okay. Good cam modern cameras are wonderful. However, I felt the videos had to be made professionally, so I applied for and acquired a Podell grant. That's a grant for emeritus professors at Cornell and uh, for retirees, I think all retirees at Cornell. And uh, I got that grant and was able to pay for a, a professional videographer. So I worked with Well Said Video to make the videos. This was also affected by the pandemic. We did not film in a studios. We filmed in a community center that I changed into a studio, sort of, with windows wide open for ventilation, cramming the actual videotaping of 12 videos into, I think it was three days, maybe it was four, but it was awfully tight. <laughs> um, but the Well Said video, well said, um, well said video did an excellent job of turning those into, I think, quite reasonable videos. They'll be redone for the fifth edition. <laughs> So uh, that's an example, one of the video headings. And there are three versions of the first draping part project for whatever, however you want to see it. Uh, for the book, I took a series of photographs showing the process. I created a video version, which is available in the online materials. And I put the original drawings also online. Um, so you can choose which mode you like. So now we're to the bulk of the book, the designs. There are about 115 designs total, 75 in the book and 40 online. Um, and the next, the middle of the book, covers the most common ready-to-wear styles. And each chapter introduces a new draping technique or concept. So chapter six, dart manipulation, demonstrates identical silhouettes with different style lines. And the use of style tape and draping is introduced in this one. The bodice styles chapter key also keeps the same silhouette, but then um, teaches how to work with different panels, joining them with seams, and also how to put seamies into a panel in order to add even more shape and how to balance and fit that seamies. The skirts chapter introduces draping away from the body silhouette, draping for flare, pleats, and gathers. Um, and the dresses in the dresses chapter, silhouettes that cross the waist with no waist seam are introduced including silhouettes that flow over the body or flare away from the body. The garments shaped the torso with double-ended darts and seams. The pants chapter introduces a combined drafting draping procedure in which the crotch seam and uh, end seam are, are created with simple draft and then the final silhouette is draped. Different pants silhouettes are demonstrated along with the pattern modifications that affect the fit of the pants. 
collar styles, collars, it's, that's simple, right? That's not, they're nothing to collars. Collars are, ah, we treat them that way, but they're not. Collar styles and necklines add a huge level of complexity. The shape that derives from the neckline shape, the curve of the neckline, a, a, a piece that sits at right angles to the neckline, and then in some cases folds over into a whole other shape. Not simple, not uh, insignificant. The kimono, raglan, and drop shoulder styles allow for excellent movement of the arm, abduction of the arm away from the body without pulling. A draping tool for these styles is introduced, a straight attachable arm, and there's an example of it, that can be pinned to the form at different angles and the sleeve panels are draped over this to create the, the, the amount of movement you want, the amount of fullness that falls under the arm when the arm is down. The shirt silhouettes are created with, without darts or seams, generally, and uh, are, require care, careful balancing. It's a good example for students that the simplest shape can be the most difficult in terms of balancing. And there's also a document that talks about set-in sleeves and the range of movement of the arm and the cap height of the sleeves and how those relate to one another. The final six chapters contain more complex styles. Built-up necklines, they're supported from below instead of falling from the shoulders or waist or hips. And I added a discussion to this chapter or in the online materials about other ways to suspend clothing other than just hanging it off the shoulders, hips, or waist. Um, cows create folds across the body supported from two to more points. They're, they can be pretty tricky. You really need to understand and be sensitive to the fabric and what you're doing to get a good balanced cowl. Strapless dresses fit every curve of the torso and, measure and uh, require a different draping technique called contour draping. Corsets change the body shape and draping strategies are described that provide negative ease so they can be strapped in tightly to compress the body. So all of the garments in this chapter um, are supported with boning and structural layers and again online described in detail. Bias styles are draped in soft fabrics and require an understanding of the intersection of yarns at a 45 degree angle. And I find them incredibly difficult. I'm not a person who works well with soft fabrics. <laughs> um, but in order to do them well, you need specific techniques on laying the fabric out uh, so that it's square, cutting it, uh, fitting, uh, a lot of different techniques that are important. Um, so, and the, there's also a discussion in this chapter in draping and the fabric that you're gonna eventually use for the garment. So the last two chapters, jackets and coats chapter included only tailored jackets. So I added a casual jacket and an outerwear winter coat, which allowed me to also demonstrate draping on a male dress form which there wasn't any in the book before. And then the uh, chapter on knits, I combined the two chapters in um, the third edition. I think both the tailored jackets and the knitwear, they're really, in this book, are intended as an introduction only. You really need to go to specialized books for those two topics. So that's a fast overview of the book, and you got to meet all my people, right? Did you notice the, the prosthetic leg and the little girl, little person and the pregnant lady? Did you see the pregnant lady? Somebody did, okay. <laughs> She's in the um, strapless. Uh, so, in the time that's left, how much time is left? Ooh, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, uh, first, quickly, why I believe draping is such an important and valuable technique, and then uh, discussion of half-scale forms. So, flat pattern making, um, it, the, yeah, we, we teach draping even though it's not used in the industry much. The difference is drafting and flat pattern making reduce the body to a series of circumferences and length measurements. Uh, they can't account for the organic shape of bodies and they, they can't really address how the clothing is going to actually hang on a body um, and balance on a body. So clothing, um, uh, pattern making, flat pattern making requires more iterations of fitting even with patterns developed from fitted slopers or when made, made by skilled flat pattern makers. Draping on three dimensions on a body form allows us to achieve good fit as the pattern is developed and perfected. We set the lines of the garment with style tape on the form, establish the grain line as each panel is placed, and uh, uh, establish the, uh, the interaction of ease, balance, and set as we perfect, join and perfect the, the panels. 
This teaches the students the importance of these factors and how they interact. When draping, the student has a tactile lesson in the relationship of fabric, the body, and silhouette for a better understanding of clothing fit. So I'm going to zoom right through um, half-scale forms. Um, the, they've been common in apparel studio, studios for decades, but only in a limited shape and a limited number of uh, sizes. And they're useful only for experimenting with shapes before going to full scale. But back in 2008, I was developing a product development class. I had limited studio space and class time. And I went to Alvanon, who makes, made their dress forms. They were one of the first from 3D body scans. And I told them, can you, can you scale your, your file down and make me a half scale form with legs? Because I wanted the students to be able to make active wear, um, swimwear, uh, lingerie, every type of clothing. Um, and they did, and these have become incredibly popular. And if you don't believe that that is half scale, it is, okay? It's half the height and half the width and half the depth. So there are a lot of advantages to working with half scale. It's faster, it's easier to see proportions on a half scale form. Smaller workspace, you don't need so much space. The forms are easy to store, less fabric needed. Does this sound familiar? All these things I struggled with in 1995, now they're solved. There are disadvantages. You must work with precision because any mistake is doubled. Uh, fabric drape will be different, although we're used to that because we're always draping in muslin and then making out of a different fabric. The patterns must be scaled up. Scaled up. Now, if you're putting them, uh, okay, that's fabric. Okay, if you're putting uh, patterns into the computer, that's insignificant. You're, you're the same process. But if you, if you don't have that technology, it's actually very easy to scale up a half scale pattern. It takes a little time, but it's easy. So that's fine, but the real revolution is the custom half-scale form. And in 2011, in my product development class, designers Brandon Wynn and Laura Swanzinger wa wanted to design for plus size, and we created the first half-scale form from a body scan. And she's quite, f quite famous now. She's named Tallulah by the students. She's well-traveled as she was uh, featured in a exhibit at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. And she now resides in the Cornell Fashion and Textile Collection as befits a revolutionary figure. So we make the forms by creating uh, uh, slices of the body and we have one today. If you guys that are actually here, you can pass it around if you like and see what they're like. We stack them and cover them with the net fabric. They cost about $25 in materials. You can see why we really need to register them with a dowel going through the slices. So if they get out of shape, then uh, out of uh, the proper orientation, they won't um, give, give the right shape. So with custom fit forms, patterns can be draped that require very little fitting for an individual. It cuts out all that fitting nonsense, OK? You go directly to a well-fitted, well-balanced pattern. Ease, grain, balance, line, and set are perfected on the form for the individual. Now for people that there, there are instructions in online materials for doing this. There's inexpensive scanning technologies today that are available to people and um, uh, software that you can do it with. But for uh, apparel programs that really don't even have that capability, there are patterns for four different forms in the online materials. So they can make these half scale forms. The mature figure is me, that's me that's being passed around. Um, so the half scale materials in the book can benefit apparel programs. Um, you can uh, have students try a variety of body types. Forms can be made for different models. Um, the, the cost in storage isn't a problem. Um, I think if you work, if apparel programs work together, then if, you know, if each one creates a set of files, an illustrator file for a different body, you can send that to all your colleagues at other universities and they can make that form. So you could have an enormous number of forms of different body types. Uh, because it's relatively easy to, to learn how to drape, independent dressmakers could use these. Sewists could have custom forms of themselves or their family. And uh, it, it can be a little difficult to do this without um, the proper technology, but maker spaces can assist local professionals and so as. And we're actually testing that out in Tompkins County at the public library making maker space. So one more quick thing, and then I'll hopefully have a few minutes for questions. Um, just as farmers markets provide access to local food, I believe there is a place 
for slow local systems of clothing production to begin to supply our cl some of our clothing. Uh, it, 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 I, ju uh, shoot, I keep losing my mouse. <sighs> okay. Um, I believe the norm should be that clothing can and should be produced in many ways for every age, ethnicity, and body type, and we have the tools to make that possible. Other technologies and tools are on the horizon. Um, the, uh, we're seeing signs in the research literature that indicate there's finally a greater understanding of the complexity inherent in making a well-fitting garment. And this is the first step towards creating a system that's not bogged down in 19th century technologies. We need to prepare our students for the 21st students. I believe an engineering approach to, to te technical design and an awareness that our industry can and should provide good fit for everybody is the place to start. So I've said way too much, <laughs> certainly enough. Thank you for being patient. And we have some time for questions. <laughs> so, yes. We have a couple questions from the online audience. Uh, so Gerald asks, how can draping be applied to making functional apparel such as firefighters turnout gear? Good, okay. So the question is how draping can be used in, in uh, functional uh, design, which generally requires stiffer, heavier fabrics, more layers of fabrics. Um, I do talk about that a little bit in draping for the overcoat, for the winter overcoat but it involves um, understanding that you do need a form that gives you that ease, that amount of um, space for the bulk of the fabric. You certainly would not want to drape in muslin, but the, the techniques and the advantages are the same, exactly the same. And then of course you would want a set of dress forms to match the range of body variation in, your, in, the, in the firefighters, which is quite great by the way. And there's a lot of research done there, so you can find out what sizes and, and body shapes you need to work with. So I hope that answers the question. <laughs> and several more questions coming in from the 80 plus the people 80 that are joining <laughs> us yeah, we online. There are more people online than we have in this room, guys. <laughs> but <laughs> jump in. I don't want to talk over people who are here in person. So if you have a question, feel free to jump in. But I have a, a number of them here otherwise. Okay. Okay, we've got one here. So, so can, you, can you comment about the, uh, what has changed for plus sizes, the making patterns that fit yeah. plus yeah. sizes? I, I can a, yeah, I can a little bit. You saw the shape of the plus size form we made. The, the dress forms that the industry is manufacturing for plus size don't look like that. And they don't look like people. Plus size is incredibly difficult. It's incredibly difficult to do um, a range of sizes that fit them. As, as your body adds more bulk, the places that you carry that weight differ widely from person to person. So there's more variation in plus size people. So I think the real answer is custom half scale dress forms for plus size women. And then it's, it's a snap, it's easy. And then of course you can really work with the aesthetics of designing for plus size, which is a really important question because again, we aren't trained to understand and, and work with the aesthetics of it. We're trained that those bodies aren't pretty. They're not, they're not right, they're not good for clothing. And that's totally wrong. Those bodies are beautiful for what they are Saying that the only bodies that you feel like you should be working with are the tall, slender models is like telling an artist, you can only work in black and white. You can't use any colors. Just work in black and white. That's all you can really do any good for. Everybody is wonderful. Everybody is precious. Everybody has its own joy, its own proportions, and can be designed for wonderfully if we train ourselves to do that. So. I could go on forever. Does that answer your question? Okay. <laughs> we have another one from online. Oh, okay. Here we go. So maybe it's more of a comment than a question, but I was struck by the you know your 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 early your start in theater, mm -hmm. uh, and then this you know how life imitates art, and that that seems to be a perfect jumping off point for <laughs> in that you must design clothes that fit well, where people can move, where yeah. people can, that, yeah. that, that is just such a perfect way to sort of the mindset. 
it was, it was for me. It really was for me. It changed from the beginning. The focus of what I did was so much on anybody, any silhouette, any fabric, any material, and how they all go together. So I was never limited to that black and white world. I always had the full range of colors, and I loved it. And I really recommend that apparel students go work in the theater. Go do a summer stock one summer. So, yep. Yes, online question. <laughs> we have a number of them. Um, so one is a quick, uh, dis do you purchase the online and actual text separately or do all the online resources? Good question. You purchase them together. Oh, 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 I need to put a slide up. Sorry, you guys. Whoops. Oh, ah, there it is. Okay. <laughs> you purchase them together. Uh, they're $120 retail. Uh, you can get them, of course, on Amazon, Amazon cheaper. God, I don't know how they do it. Um, but I recommend that you publish, you purchase through Fairchild or through Bloomsbury. Um, there's a 35% discount, discount code. The online material comes in a, car, a card with a, oh, thank you, Catherine, on a card with a um, number that you um, use to set up your account online. So you'll have a, a um, card like this that has your own, your own specific number that you scratch off. And I forget how to do this. Uh, oops. I escape. Wait a minute. I escape. And what? Oh, it's there. Ah, OK. So this is what you get, OK? So once you get your number in under your name up there, you see where Susan is with the down arrow? That's where you click. I, I actually need to get it online. Or can I click? Can I? Oh, I can bring it over, can I? Ah. OK. And when you click it, my course materials come up. And you get this screen. Can I scroll that? Oh, yeah, OK. And this, this is what you'll get, table of contents. If you're an instructor, you need to contact Fairchild and get the instructor materials, OK? And when you click this, you'll get the list of chapters. And let's find a good chapter. Oh, I don't know where a good chapter is. Uh, oh, look at, no, not that one, not that one. Not that one, not that one. All right, one of these is going to be a good one. Okay, well, let's try this one. Okay, so in studio resources, you get in this chapter, you get three designs that aren't in the book. Okay, um, all the way down. In this chapter, you, oops, sorry, you won't get this. This is because I have instructor stuff, unless you have instructor stuff. Yeah, a lot of designs. I, uh, I, know, I 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 know. You get, um, in this chapter, you get, there we go. You get a printable measurement sheet, so you don't have to try and do it, copy it from the book. A full set of measurement instructions. They're kind of scattered through the book. Um, you get the body, body landmark form I saw you. Um, you get a document on sizing and fit for diverse body types. Please read this. It's not very good. I'll do better in the fifth edition. <laughs> but it really just is a start on how to start training your eye. Um, and then uh, uh, how to drape on a too, too large dress form. If you don't have a dress form small enough, lots of stuff. Draping directly on the model, which I don't recommend. And then all the half scale information is here. So yeah, question. So many more. Um, Irene says, very interesting and enlightening. Could you comment on design and processes that take into account non-binary identities? Oh, that is so much fun. <laughs> that is, I mean, talk about expanding your world to color. Now expand your world to color and dimension. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I'm not an expert, but I can see the potential. Um, actually, when I was in the pandemic, I was um, stuck because I wanted to do male male designs, and uh, I didn't have a dress form. And I couldn't just walk into the studio and get one. Campus was closed. So right at the end of this document for how to create, ah, there it is, how to create um, a, a, a special body type, a specific one, I took a foam dress form, flattened the bust, and created a male shape 
from that dress form. And I found that quite fascinating. And I would say do that as your first step. Because then you really start to understand the differences physiologically in males and females. And that will give you a stepping off point. And then, I don't know, I just have to work with individual clients to find out where they want to go, what they want to do, what image they want to create. Um, it's, it's, it's an amazing and wonderful world to be in, I think, to have that. Um, to have that capability and to have the, those people that are just wonderful to work with. So, yeah. <laughs> I hope I answered the question. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, next question is, how do you adjust the fabric phys fabric's physical behavior for the half-scale versions, yeah. which, because of the reduced scale, will behave more stiffly and will stretch differently at full than the full-scale? Um, you know, I really struggled with that at the beginning, and I, I said, oh, we have to find half-scale fabrics that have smaller yarns and tighter weaves or maybe looser weaves or some different kind of weaves. And I, I, I didn't find anything I did was very successful, and so I just kind of ignored it, and that ended up being the best thing to do <laughs> because we really haven't found that it's a huge problem, and I think it is because we, when we... When we work with draping anyway, we're, we, we can't drape in the, the actual fabric because it's too expensive. You know, as, as uh, educators, we don't have wholesale prices. And so we choose to use muslin. And muslin is an amazing fabric. And I talk about that a lot in the book and why it's so good for draping. But it doesn't have the properties of the final fabric. But we, l we learn by using that as the base Okay, so we always drape in muslin, and then we make it in this, and this, and this, and this, and this, all the different types of, of fabrics that we can use. And we start to understand that transition to the real fabric. And I think that's what's happening with half scale, too. I don't know, you guys that have worked with half scale, do you, do you find it a problem? No, I'm getting a lot of uh-uhs. Okay, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, you think it would be a huge problem, and early textbooks that talk about half scale say, oh, it's going to be a huge problem. We haven't really found that it's so. Any more? Yes, I have any more. Okay, carry on. I'll keep talking as long as anybody wants to listen to my voice. <laughs> Monica says, uh, great talk, thank you. A general question, uh, what do modern bon body scanners um, have that's missing for widespread adoption in the fashion industry and education, and where should more developments be directed? Um, you know, that, it's, it's such a fast-changing field. Um, the handheld scanners are pretty amazing. They work very, very well, and they're very affordable. Does anybody know if it's still $500 for the, what is it, in um, structure, the structure scanner? Do you know if it's still $500? Uh, yeah, I think, I think you can get a, a, the one we've used, which is a handheld scanner called Structure. For $500, it hooks onto an iPad, and it works very well for this purpose. So, but it's changing really fast. I don't think that we should even look at the $100,000 scanner that we have standing in our research lab that takes up half the room. Um, that's good for research, and it's sometimes essential for research, but for this purpose, keep an eye out. There's all kinds of apps now being developed. I'm sure many of them would be perfectly okay for this. All you need to do is um, make sure that you, uh, I'd say, put a waste tape on so you can find the waste. Yeah. Do we have to? Just a related question to that is yeah. that someone else asks, in your opinion, what is the best app for body scanning? Oh, I don't know. I'm sorry, I can't answer that one. I wish I could. I wish I could. But I haven't been following. I'm retired, guys. <laughs> and I've been very deliberately not following the literature too closely because I'll drive myself crazy. <laughs> I got to get out in that garden. <laughs> um, so I don't know, check with uh, people that do body scan research um, and I'm sure you have an answer to that. Um, but when you use the, the, make sure that you have a good me a waist tape and a good measurement of a, a circumference and a length measurement because you need to make sure when you transfer that into the digital form, you have it scaled right. That's all I'd say. Other than that, I'm sure m there are many, many different ones that will work well. So. Uh, do you believe there is some method of grading that can be successfully used or that all garments should be custom uh, graded? <laughs> oh, oh, you really want me to get myself in trouble, don't you? Uh, 
<laughs> I do not believe that grading the way that it works now can work at all, at all. I do believe that if you study body size in depth and really start to understand how body shape changes in the main as body size goes up or down, that you can find a way to create a single style and learn how to change those patterns to fit each of those changed bodies. That's a big study. I never managed to accomplish it when I was doing research. But I think it's doable. I think with industry support, it would be very doable. And then in terms of grading, I don't know. You'd have to come up with a whole new system. There are grading systems that I know work on two dimensions, but you'd probably need three or four dimensions to actually make a graded set of patterns. I say a graded set because those graded patterns will not, will not and should not nest. Okay, that's because they're proportional that you can make a nest of patterns. And that, we don't nest. Our bodies don't nest. So why the hell, sorry, why the heck do we think that the patterns should nest? Okay, so I hope that answers your question. <laughs> it's complicated. Related, another question. How transferable are draped patterns for, for one body to multiple bodies? Mm. I, you know, that's what I think the advantage of the half-scale custom form is. Not really, but I do think that if the industry picks their fit models more carefully, um, picks multiple fit models, maybe for multiple sizes, maybe not a fit model for each size, but for you know every other size, and um, uses a half-scale dress form of those models to create their designs, I think they could do a lot better than they do now. I think the flat pattern methods that are used today are, they just absolutely smother innovation, I think, because they're so restrictive. You know, if you can play with fabric on a form and know that that's going to fit your fit model, you're not going to have to go through six versions of fittings to get it to fit your fit model. You can be so much more creative in the industry. Uh, more questions. Uh, one is a quick one. When do you expect the fifth edition? Oh, I plan to start working on that in two years. I think five or six years, and I thank you very much for asking that question because I am um, asking all of you, please, to collaborate with me on the fifth edition. I am no longer teaching. I do not have the advantage of knowing what our next generation students are going to need in order to learn well. So please, please, please get back to me. Tell me about errors in the book. I know they're there, especially the Whew, don't worry about the typos and the mistakes in the online materials. I never had an editor for that, okay? So that, I edited it myself a couple of times, but a lot slipped through. Um, we won't get started on the copy editing that did not happen with this book. <laughs> that was a nightmare. Um, the editors were wonderful, but the copy editing process was a disaster. Um, so there are a lot of mistakes. I want to know about them. I, desperately want to know what works. Does it work to have that chapter four? Um, uh, is the, is the, is, does each chapter really have a purpose? Are there some designs that should go entirely all on? Do we really need the twist styles? Boy, I, I really struggled over that one. <laughs> should those all go online? Just let me know. Let me know what, what it does in the classroom because you are the ones who will help shape the fifth edition. Great. Um, Emma says, uh, I'm not a fashion student, but I am sewing for myself and friends in my spare time. I use commercial <laughs> patterns at the moment, but want to do better. Yes. Is this book too comprehensive for someone that does not work in the industry? Absolutely not. You will love this book. <laughs> this book, it really does start from the very beginning. You'll need to get a hold of a dress form, um, but you can also make a dress form. You can make one of the dress forms in the book. Um, and uh, no, it's, it's, I, th I kept you in mind as I was writing this book. I very much had you in mind because I was you at one point and I would have loved this book. So <laughs> go for it. <laughs> um, do you have any insights into where the how-to instructions in standing drafting instructions originated? Yeah, I really do. You know, the, the how-to books that we're stuck with, 
They were designed for a different purpose. They were designed in the days of home economics. They were designed when women helped clothe their family because it was cheaper to buy fabric than it was to buy clothes. And so it was really good how-to instruction to teach them just what they needed to know, how to make these clothes for their family, okay? Very different purpose. And that's where the, our books have, our whole method of teaching, everything we have, has stuck in that, in that era. Um, so yeah, I think there's a very, a very clear um, understanding of why those books are the way, the books are the way that they are. I was gonna say something else, what was it? Uh, it's gone. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Yeah, good. How do you suppose people that want to like start their own brand go about sizing? Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. So if so, if somebody wants to start their own brand, how do you go about sizing? You, you you first you understand that it's very difficult and that there's no real solution out there. The best thing you can do is be very clear about your target market, and make sure that that's who you're advertising to and make sure that you're communicating everything you can about the sizes you are producing and who they're gonna fit and who they will not fit. I would say right away start with a couple of different lines with a couple of different fits for a couple of different kinds of bodies. I know it's hard when you're starting because you don't have the resources to do a lot, but just doing that much will signal the world that you understand that this is not everyone, <laughs> and that everyone does deserve to have your wonderful, beautiful, fantastic clothing that you design. So that's about all I can say, sorry. Keep an eye on, the, on what's happening in the world, because as I say, there's some really good technologies coming. So, yeah. OK, one last question. <laughs> is there a bibliography for more information on grading, draping resources, et cetera? Not on grading, because I don't believe in it. <laughs> but there is a full bibliography in the book that uh, brings in a lot of, a lot of different uh, re resources, all the ones that I've loved and used through the years, new ones that are coming out. There are some amazing books coming out. So yes, that's part of the book, along with a resource list that tells you where to buy things, where to buy professional tools and things like that. So, yep. OK. Thank you all, all of you who are here and all of you that Zoomed in. This has been so much fun. <laughs> I hope it's been fun for you too. And please get in touch with me. <laughs>